Okay, um, we'll get started. So good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining Alumni in the Arts Analyzing and Advising. We're pleased to welcome you to the fourth edition of panel discussions sponsored by the Museum Club and are excited to announce that this installment of Alumni in the Arts is being hosted in conjunction with the Arts at Dartmouth Career Days. The Museum Club is a group of students from all different majors and backgrounds who share a common interest in art, material, culture, and museums. The group meets once a week and acts as a bridge between the museum and campus. If you would like to learn more, please visit our page on the Hood Museum's website. This evening, we're joined by two distinguished alumni who will speak about their careers. Brooke Minto, a one, is the executive director of the Black Trustee Alliance for Art Museums and the managing director at Advisory Board for the Arts. And Michael Klein, 14, is the head of art market research and analytics at Sotheby's. My name is Hallie Dantis and I'm a Dartmouth 21 and member of the Alumni in the Arts Committee. I'm an art history major and I'm currently the Levinson intern for campus engagement at the Hood. I will be one of the moderators for our program and will be joined by two other student moderators, Abby and Emily, who will be facilitating the prepared question portion of the event. Hey y'all, my name is Abby Smith and I'm a 23 from Georgia. I'm an art history major and I'm a member of the Museum Club's Alumni in the Arts Committee. Hi guys, I'm Emily Andrews. I'm a 22 from Oklahoma and I'm studying government and anthropology. And I am also a member of the Museum Club's Alumni in the Arts Committee. Just before we begin, we just have a couple of reminders. Um, this evening's discussion will run for about an hour and consist of two sections. In the first section, Abby and Emily will deliver a series of questions for the panelists. Then in the second part, I'll field Q&A from the audience. At any point during the event, please, please submit your questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom. We strongly encourage you to ask any questions at all that you have, and we will do our best to get to as many as possible in the second half of the program. Please also note that this program is being recorded and we will share the link on the Hood Museum social media platforms in the coming days. We are also providing Zoom's auto-generated captions. This is not a perfect service, so please be aware that there are bound to be some translation errors. If you wish to turn them off, go to the live captions icon in your Zoom to toolbar and select hide subtitles. Uh, now we'll ask our speakers to introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with Brooke. Um, Brooke, would you please share with us a little bit about your current role and your background? Sure. Thanks, Abby and Haley and Emily. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Um, really excited to have this chat with you and all the other current students who are online right now. Um, I actually have two current roles um, at the moment, and both are quite interesting uh, in this time and somewhat related. Um, I am working for two relatively new sort of startup initiatives. Uh, one, an organization, Advisory Board for the Arts, that works with cultural organizations, both visual and performing arts organizations uh, globally to help them you know, reach their uh, goals and most uh, excellently fulfill their mission. Um, it's a, a research-driven uh, consultancy. I'm also the executive director of a relatively new initiative called the Black Trustee Alliance for Art Museums, which is a collective of trustees that are currently serving on art museum boards in North America. And they are united in their goal to you know, best serve their institutions and make those museums as equitable and as inclusive as possible. Thanks so much for that, Brooke. It sounds like you're going to have some really great insights that I can't wait to get more into. Michael, would you also mind giving us an introduction about your current role and your background? Absolutely. So thank you, everybody, for, for having me. Um, really great to be back at Dartmouth, even if only virtually. Um, so I'm Michael. I'm 14. Um, and I currently work for Sotheby's, which is one of the uh, oldest and largest auction houses uh, globally. And uh, but in what that really means is we're, we're really a global art, uh, global marketplace that sells art and luxury items via auctions, private sales, buy now e-commerce and in-person retail. Um, it's been a really exciting uh, opportunity um, and a unique role that combines data analysis, advisory and strategy all together. So my role specifically is that I run the uh, market research initiative with which has uh, Sotheby's May Moses as its crown jewel. So. Sotheby's May Moses is uh, it's a it's a set of indices that measure art market prices. It was built from two economists at NYU Stern, 
and it's uh, one of the best measures of art market prices and it uses uh, works that have been sold multiple times at auction to use the change in value to figure out where the market is. Um, so I've, for about four years now, I've overseen um, all the data, publishing analysis and leveraging the insights for, for our clients in the business um, and uh, getting to really know the, the art ecosystem um, from a pretty exciting and unique vantage point. And uh, for that, uh, I worked in management consulting at uh, Deloitte. Uh, I was based in New York, uh, part of their general management rotation, although had a bit of an alignment with financial services for a number of projects and uh, was also part of their art and finance team, which I'm sure we'll get into in a bit. All right, well, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, and next we will move into the prepared questions. Um, so I'm gonna be asking the first one. Um, and Brooke, uh, if you don't mind answering first, um, how did your time at Dartmouth help shape or motivate your career path? And then Michael, you'll go second. Thanks for that, Abby. Um, I think my time at Dartmouth was really integral to shaping my career path. Um, I you know, started my undergraduate um, experience at Dartmouth knowing I wanted to major in art history, um, but not necessarily having a sense of where that might take me. I thought, you know, maybe I'd go on and get my PhD and become an academic and a professor of art history. I spent a year or two, you know, on that path. And then at one point I thought, oh, I'll go to law school and maybe, you know, I'll, you know, spend my career working with artist estates or in some kind of intellectual property law. Um, but it was really in my senior year that I decided I wanted to go on to grad school in art history and um, sort of further my knowledge of art history, but also really kind of hone my critical thinking and writing skills, um, in, specifically in post-war and contemporary art. Uh, and so that's what I did. I went on to graduate school immediately after Dartmouth. That said, um, my time at the Hood Museum of Art was really integral to my overall experience and education at Dartmouth. I worked at the Hood Museum throughout my time at Dartmouth. I was um, a part-time research assistant to both the curators of American and European art at the museum at the time. I did, you know, um, primary source uh, research on the objects in the collection, wrote object labels, um, assisted with catalog and exhibitions research. And then during my senior year um, was a senior curatorial intern and had the chance to really delve into the collection over two trimesters and then spend a trimester preparing what was my first exhibition um, that was then later staged in the Harrington Teaching Galleries. Um, the summer after graduation. So, you know, my time at the Hood was absolutely sort of pendant to my art history coursework and helped to sort of set me on a, on a particular path, you know, to grad school and then beyond. All right, same question for me. So um, really interesting to hear your background, Brooke, because it's really different from mine. <laughs> So um, I was not an art history major, although I did study a number of art history courses, but um, in general, I'd say Dartmouth was enormously influential in, in so many different ways. Um, to start at really high level, I, I, I'm a big proponent of liberal arts, and I think the idea of just having such a diverse kind of education really prepares you for so many different possibilities and also being able to just deal with the ambiguity that comes along the road of a, of a long career. Um, specifically though, um, I was an economics and geography double major and also took a number of courses in art history. I missed the minor by uh, just a little bit. Um, and all three departments have been really, really uh, influential for me. So for economics, um, I think one of the biggest takeaways was learning how to use data to answer big questions um, and understanding how markets work. Uh, for geography, it was combining the, the quantitative and the qualitative analysis together. And then also thinking about problems in a spatialized context. Um, and very useful working for a global company. Um, and, uh, and finally, art history, I think, really was that passion in the arts. Um, and that's sort of what had pulled me in. So I had started off really focused on the first two areas of Dartmouth, and it was more my senior year. I started taking a number of classes. I'd always been visiting the Hood Museum throughout my time there. I, my, the Orozco mural room was my go-to study area uh, for much of my time. Um, and um, and so I think the the classes in art history, A, just gave me so much excitement about art and wanting to be around it. Um, and then B, frankly, it gave me the general content that's been so useful for being able to 
run the numbers on the yard and to understand art by understanding really what's underlying that we're, we're working with. Um, and then also I'll, as an additional piece that I think I really did take away from the courses was understanding the how perceptions about art change over time and how what we think about a painting today is not necessarily what we're going to think about it tomorrow. And knowing that things sometimes come into favor and go out of favor and understanding that. Um, you know, I, that was something I learned in my undergraduate that kept me really curious and is, has been a big pull in, in my current work. And then lastly, I would just say that um, I think just the writing skills, I certainly, ter certainly got a lot of important, valuable criticism on some of my writing early on at Dartmouth. And so that's helped me as I've been writing and authoring articles to package my ideas. Um, so that's uh, for me. For that, I think, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't speak for the entire student body here, but I think it's very reassuring to hear about your backgrounds and know that kind of everyone does get pulled in a variety of different ways. We don't have to find like the one true passion that, you know, that makes everything else fall away. It's good to combine things. I think that's very helpful and very inspiring. Uh, so for our next question, uh, we wanted to ask, how do your respective careers influence how you see and interact with the artwork? Do you think this viewpoint has changed since you graduated Dartmouth? And this time, let's start with Michael first, and then we'll move on to Brooke. Sure. So um, I would say because I wasn't so involved with, with, uh, with art while on campus, I think a lot of what I've gained over time is really has given me that window to understanding. Um, so I'd say the big change has just been learning. Um, but a couple of the big takeaways I've learned. So I think for me, it's been really awesome to be around art all the time. Um, one of the coolest things about Salo is to be able to walk into the building and the galleries will be filled with all kinds of diverse types of art um, at different points in the year. And just having that kind of variety around me every day and to be able to be around it has been really exciting. And it's been such a great learning opportunity. Um, so that was one piece. I think a second thing is about um, the importance of not just seeing art, but actually owning art. That I think while it was great to be able to go to museums growing up, I think that starting to think about collecting art and, and, and sort of move into that realm has been a really interesting experience to learn what what it takes to sort of want to buy art to want to live with art to want to sponsor artists and so and then and so I think that was something I hadn't really thought about much as an undergrad that's um, been a big takeaway from from my work um, another thing I think is just understanding the broad spectrum of the the art ecosystem of how many different career paths how many industries are are involved and so so for some places, you know, for example, like when I was at Deloitte, there were a couple people that had an, that had some sort of involvement with art, even if it wasn't what they were doing day to day. Um, so just knowing that there's so many different ways that that can that can tie in is um, is interesting, and being able to foster connections with people um, from so many different backgrounds that we can all sort of share an interest in art is uh, is exciting. And then I think lastly, and maybe this is more of my own fault, but. I didn't, I think I grew up really liking uh, modern art and old masters and really was not one for contemporary art. And so at least, especially in my time at Sotheby's, I have learned a tremendous amount of, about contemporary uh, and gotten even more excited in that realm. Thanks, Michael. Um, I might answer the second question first. You asked if my viewpoint has changed since I've graduated and, and yes, I realize that this year, while we won't have reunion, it's uh, my 20th anniversary. So I have um, learned quite a lot in the last 20 years. And so I'd say my knowledge is much deeper and more broad of the art world. Um, you know, I have always loved art and was a, you know, museum kid growing up, but, um, you know, since I've graduated, um, you know, I've just learned such a tremendous amount. And I think in terms of my career and how I interact with the art world, um, once I finished grad school, I began my career in museums and uh, started first at a New York museum and then had an opportunity to live for many years in Miami and South Florida and then in New Orleans. And then I moved back to New York and also had the chance to work at a museum abroad in Cape Town in South Africa. So I think in terms of how my career has you know, been a lens for the art world, moving so much and being in institutions um, all across this country and having the opportunity to work abroad has really allowed me to sort of 
live the sort of global art world to understand not only institutions all over and how they function differently in different cities of different sizes, different communities, um, but also to understand the global art market. Um, you know, how museums and the art market work together, whether it's uh, artists, galleries, auction houses, um, and, and to be able to kind of compare and contrast, you know, art centers like New York with smaller secondary and tertiary cities um, and emerging markets has been really interesting and being able to sort of move and live in all of these places for some period of time and really immerse myself in different cultures has been a tremendous opportunity. Um, and certainly something that I couldn't have predicted when I was a student at Dartmouth, I thought I would leave, I'd go to grad school in New York and probably spend the rest of my days working at New York institutions. You know, we're very fortunate here in New York City to have great museums, great collections. And I certainly never anticipated this sort of uh, global trajectory that I've been on, um, but I loved it and I appreciate it. And it's been the most wonderful education beyond school. Well, thank you all so much. That's so interesting to hear, Michael, about how you're like buying art and all that stuff. That's very, very cool. And Brooke, it's so cool to hear about everywhere that you've lived. I can't wait to hear more of that, about that and the rest of this panel. Um, so our next question is for Brooke. Um, we saw that you got a master's degree in modern art and critical studies from Columbia. Um, and we wanted to know how graduate school impacted your career path. And do you think it gave you more opportunities? And would you do it again? So I'll start with the easy part first. Yes, I would do it again. Um, for me, I think it was a very essential complement to my undergraduate um, education at Dartmouth. The two programs were very different. And I think together they really provided me with a kind of full complement of skills to go off and do the work that I've done. Um, I can't imagine having one without the other. Um, and then how did graduate school impact my career path? I think after, you know, so I, I grew up in the New York area, just outside of New York City. So I knew, I knew the city, but, you know, wasn't a city kid necessarily, but it was familiar. Then having gone off to Hanover for four years, I think it was really essential for me to come back to New York for grad school um, and to be sort of back around institutions, um, to have just that proximity to see exhibitions, whether they were at museums or galleries, um, to also begin visiting artist studios. You know, you have um, we're just sort of spoiled in New York to have, you know, so much density of art making here. And after having been in Hanover for, for four years while I was studying the history of art and really getting that grounding, um, it was very important for me to be back at a, as a graduate student in the city. And I think, yeah, it was really essential to um, making that segue into a professional career afterwards, just becoming more familiar and confident with the ways in which the art world works. Um, going to openings, going on studio visits, doing all kinds of things, visiting galleries. You know, this is the kind of thing that I did while I was at graduate school in my free time, but also as I began to do research for my master's thesis, um, I, I think, you know, I would absolutely do it the same way in New York, if not maybe London or some other major um, art city, because it's really important, I think, to have, you know, um, experience in a, in a city out in the world as you're doing this, you know, graduate research um, that helps to inform your eventual professional path. Thank you for that, Brooke. I think it's really great how you managed to combine both the benefits of going to grad school in general and also with your specific story. I think that's, that's really kind of empowering. And then for our next question, uh, we wanted to ask this to Michael. Uh, given that you have a background in management consulting, can you speak a little bit about what made you decide to pivot to a position that focused more on art specifically? And what advice would you have for students that are interested in working in the arts, but not in a traditional museum or gallery role? I don't think you're unmuted, Michael. There we go. We're off mute. Great. Um, <laughs> So uh, great questions. So first, uh, the pivot. So when I got to Deloitte about a month in, I learned that we had an art and finance practice area, um, which to me just blew my mind. Um, you know, fast forward, I, I don't think any other firm, uh, consulting firm really had that. So it was certainly just the, the luck of the draw. Um, it's a small group, the leaders based out in Luxembourg, actually. 
Um, but they've got a really great team of people that are interested about the intersection of art, technology, and financial services. Um, so they publish an annual report, which is one of the most read pieces of um, eminence that all of Deloitte publishes, and it's one of the biggest uh, reports in the art market. And so I got to be part of that right off the bat. And so I could learn who are the players in the art market, um, what's going on, what are the latest trends. Um, and so to, for me to just be able to get to see that ecosystem, I got super excited about it. And knowing that I could take many of the skills that I had started to build within consulting, understanding financial services, I started to see that there really was a need for people in the art world that understand um, some of the financial aspects to it. Um, and so that's what really motivated me to want to go and, and look in this area. Um, in terms of the advice that I would have for students, um, I would say that a career is a really long time. And so um, just because you don't start, if you're interested in art, just because you don't necessarily start off in art doesn't mean you can't end up in art. And um, I think at least for me, coming from management consulting, I learned a lot of the really valuable uh, sort of general business skills that were so important to me when I came to Sotheby's. Um, so to be able to go through, at least for me to go through a structured training uh, program to learn, to just have such a, a diversity of experiences, um, and it was, um, it was, that was really helpful for me to be able to pivot into the art world and to be able to have sort of a niche for me. Well, thank you so much, Michael. That's really interesting hearing that, like, you know, just because you don't start out in art, you can get into art things eventually. That's very reassuring. Um, and all right, so our next question is for Brooke, since you work in diversity and advising. Um, our question is, what are some of the most successful initiatives museums have instituted in order to promote and achieve diversity in their collections? It's a really good one. And certainly one that I think is still evolving, especially motivated by you know our current moment and the events of the last year. but. Certainly over the last couple of years, I've noticed a number of institutions partnering with major foundations or foundations funding um, internships and fellowships that are very specific to engaging um, more uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the professional world of the arts, whether that's um, on museum track careers or artists. Um, I've just seen a lot of major institutions funding really wonderful initiatives and partnering with museums uh, all over the country to ensure that there are these sort of pipeline opportunities for um, young and emerging professionals. Um, and I've been really impressed with them and I think they are certainly programs that can be replicated, whether it's for curatorial studies or conservation. Um, I just think they're important sort of uh, pipeline builders professionally. Um, I've also been really um, impressed by a number of appointments that have been made in the last year um, to, you know, senior level curatorial roles, uh, curators of color. Um, I've also seen over the last year really interesting sort of acquisitions initiatives and endowments being formed at museums to focus on um, making collections more equitable. So really um, focusing on uh, acquiring artists of um, Black or Indigenous background or women artists. So this real um, concerted effort to look at collections and to attempt to make them more representative going forward and to create the resources necessary to, to maintain um, this level of acquisition. So I think the work is certainly just begun and every institution in this country is thinking about these things and um, at a different stage of its evolution, but I've certainly been inspired by a number of programs, whether that's to develop professionals or to develop collections to develop you know, future museum leaders. Um, you know, there have definitely been a number of programs that have inspired me and, and I, I do feel confident that museums are thinking differently and, and moving in a direction um, that will create for more expansive institutions. Thank you for that, Brooke. I'm, I think hearing about how much the museum industry is kind of changing and becoming more diverse and inclusive is really great pardon me, especially for um, students like us that are moving on and about to graduate. It's a great time to, I think, get involved and start learning how we can make a difference in the world and make it 
better make it what it should be. Um, all right, and then for what I believe is our last prepared question, this is from Michael. Uh, so, you know, to keep on with these somewhat, I don't know, societally relevant topical questions, we know that there are quite a few people who often view art as simply being an investment rather than being art for art's sake. Um, and so we wanted to ask, what do you think about the debate with people who do see it as more of an investment versus that see it and value it for more artistic purposes? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so let me start off by saying that art is, I think, unequivocally an asset. It's not necessary. It can be an investment. It can be a great investment. It's not often a great investment. And I think the focus on it being uh, as just an investment is not the smartest idea. Um, to start off at least with art being an asset, there's over, there's around 50 to $80 billion uh, spent on art annually. Um, there's about $1.7 trillion of uh, art held privately. And uh, there's about 20 to $25 billion of loans generated each year that are backed by art. So I think all of those things are, are indicative of how there is some sort of a financial value to art. Um, more broadly, though, um, I think that art will pay dividends in ways that are not necessarily financial, just by being able to enjoy it and, and to share it. And so um, I think that um, when buying art, it, you, people want, you, know, you should be buying at a level that is comfortable, but I think to buy solely for an investment opportunity, um, if you're not liking the underlying art, um, that's not a safe bet. And uh, I think if you're really trying to just make money, I think there's better, easier ways to do it. Um, that said, though, uh, and this sort of kind of um, builds off of a little bit of what Brooke was saying, um, in terms of what has been the best investment or what have been great investments as of recent, um, I've done a lot of work just looking at my price indices to see where value has been changing. And I think it's a really, really encouraging sign that some of the um, some of the, the largest value increases in recent years have been for for black artists and for female artists. And so what I'm talking about is that works that have come to auction have then returned to auction at a much higher rate. And I think the big uh, difference is that there's been a ton of attention to female artists and to black artists to better understand their contributions and to understand how we may not have given enough attention to really understand what made the art great. And so um, it's been, I found it really encouraging to see when, you know, works coming back with extra zeros to them as the narrative really changes about how it's not just say a woman who is making, um, abstract expressionist art, but it's really somebody who was leading the discussion, was influencing others, and was creating something that really has lasting historical value. Um, and so the financial value is sort of a barometer to measure some of the progress that we've made. Um, and that's not to say there's not more progress that needs to be made. And if there's, there's, this is, there's no doubt that the art world needs to become more inclusive, but I think it's understanding that what we think of great today, we might be discounting things that really deserve more attention. And so at least to give the excitement to want to look for it, to find what is great art and why it's great uh, is certainly an important thing. All right, thank you both so much for providing us with this insight into your careers in the art world and your insight into you know, Dartmouth and life kind of more in general, it's been really, enlightening and really fantastic for us. Now, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that I personally love learning about your time at Dartmouth and your careers, but I believe Hallie has some questions she would like to pose from the audience, so I will go ahead and turn it over to her. Yes, yeah, so um, everyone, the audience, please continue submitting questions and we will be um, sure to get to as many as we can. Um, the first question is for Brooke. Um, we are wondering sort of, since you've had so many different experiences working in the arts, um, which one was the most impactful on your career? Thanks, Hallie. Um, you know, it's tough to pick one um, experience because I've, you know, 
really been influenced by quite a lot of them. But I think when I um, think about the major shift in my career, um, the most pivotal experience was one in Miami. So um, I began my career in museums in curatorial and education and working mostly in programmatic work, collections work, exhibitions and so forth. And then while I lived in Miami for seven years, I had the opportunity to work on a capital campaign and the building of a new museum. Uh, at the time it was called Miami Art Museum. And during my last lap there, it changed names as a result of a major gift to the museum. And it's now called Prez Art Museum Miami. Um, and so it was during that period, I think in 2008, when um, I really sort of switched professional roles from more programmatic facing role to one that was more based um, in fundraising and eventually external affairs. And when I started, you know, working with museums on strategy and planning. So I would say it was that experience that um, kind of opened up my, my possibilities of how um, I could function in an institution and help to guide and steer institutions. And that was really the moment in which it happened. So um, it was, you know, working on this campaign to build a new building and, you know, really set an institution on a different path, a critically new path. Um, and go from sort of a quiet community center based, a community based art museum to a very fantastic kind of global um, institution with a growing collection and a wonderful exhibition program. Um, and for me, it, it completely shifted how I work in institutions and think about, you know, my life at a museum. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds like a great experience. Um, the next question is for Michael. Um, we were curious how, how um, sorry, how do you handle art or artists with somewhat questionable backgrounds or histories? Do you find that this affects the perceived value of the art at all? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, look, I would say it's 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 hard to say. So I think right now. I mean, in general, the market has constantly been reevaluating artists. And I think obviously with the current movement, there's a lot more of that happening. Um, and I think that it's becoming increasingly clear that artist backgrounds are even more of a key element to collectors. Um, so uh, so um, I think it's sort of, so that we're, we're a marketplace and, and, we, and, and so we bring buyers and sellers together and um, I'm not sure that I've, I've witnessed a lot of change, but that doesn't mean that preferences can't change as more knowledge becomes uh, available. Um, so I would say, though, more on the on the questionable art side, though, and this is something I, I do have a little more experience on. Um, Sotheby's has really has a really great team focused on doing provenance research to make sure that um, everything that's being sold really is properly owned. And a lot of this is around doing a World War II kind of, 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 ser of, uh, of searching. So to make sure that everything that was, that, that was uh, every, every work that was created before the war is, is really accounted for and that we are, we're holding ourselves to a really high standard. Um, can, on the converse side of that, um, what's really, really exciting to be a part of is when work has been restituted and we bring it to auction. Um, and so we will see that, you know, that it, we're sort of, we're able to give restitution to the families and, and the art oftentimes will find a really great new home. Um, and then another thing is, is about fakes, that uh, Sotheby's has a phenomenal uh, laboratory that's able to do testing to uh, authenticate paintings um, and to make sure that they're originals. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, we have, Another question, and maybe we'll start with Brooke, and if Michael, you have any color to add, that would be great. But what are your thoughts on the deaccession of art by museums, most recently the Newark Museum and Sotheby's? And if you could maybe provide some context for um, the audience, that'd be great. Yeah, it's an important question, certainly one that's quite topical right now. Um, and just you know, for a little background, thank you for whoever that question's from. It's, it's a kind of hot button issue um, in the art world. Um, uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, over the past year, the major sort of um, standards organizations in museums, both the American Alliance of Museums and the Association of Art Museum Directors, uh, sort of loosened the restrictions around the um, 
deaccessioning of works from a museum's collection. So in the past, museums really were only um, deaccessioning works for the sole purpose of replenishing acquisitions funds. So if a work was deaccessioned from the collection, those funds would have to, you know, buy new work or to um, contribute to an acquisitions endowment. So with so many institutions uh, suffering over the last year with closure and with um, reduced uh, revenue from admissions and from fundraising galas and all the rest, um, the two uh, associations told museums that they could, until 2022, so for a two year period, deaccession works more liberally and use the proceeds of those sales to help um, with uh, critical operating expenses. So whether that's running their facility or to keep um, museum staff employed, you know, for this period of 24 months, those funds could be used for general operations, which is usually not permitted. Um, that said, I think, you know, every museum that we've read about that has been engaged in deaccessioning has gone about in a different way. Um, you know, some have been, I think, really thoughtful in how they've gone through their collections and have chosen works that maybe are duplicates or redundant in some way, or artists that they have in great depth where they can, you know, make um, a sale of a work and there isn't really a hole in the collection necessarily. And then I think there's been some controversy around other institutions selling, you know, what a community feels is a major work that's beloved by local audiences or a work that might have been donated by a founding donor of the museum or a founding trustee of the museum, or works that have been donated to collections directly from an artist or an artist's estate. Um, so it's sort of hard to uh, answer this question, you know, with one brush and say that, you know, it's either good or bad, but I think every institution has gone about, you know, their response to this change um, in the rules or this relaxation of the rules very differently. Um, and, and every institution has had more critical, you know, some have had more critical needs than others. So it's definitely a case by case basis. Um, I think in general, if it allows a museum to keep its doors open and to keep staff employed, it's definitely a positive thing in the short term. But I think it's also a wake up call for every institution to think more about reserve funds and other ways that they plan for this kind of emergency. You know, no uh, field or industry saw this pandemic coming. And so I think, um, you know, as we think about safety nets of all kinds that we're missing in our country and across industries, this is really one for, for museums to think about, you know, what do you do in a time of crisis um, that, you know, the option of selling works out of the collection isn't really something that needs to be considered. Awesome, thank you for that. That's um, definitely a very topical um, discussion and great to hear your views on those. Um, Michael, we have a, another question for you. Um, have you ever come across artworks in the May Moses that defy all expectations um, and either catastrophically underperform or outperform their estimates? So what I'll say about estimates is that there are certainly times that we don't know how to price the work accurately. And so um, just because we either, we're, not, we're not sure, um, we'll see a, a large discrepancy. So I think, for example, um, there's a lot of works that are sold on the primary market where there's a, where the gallery has sold them for a at a particular price point. And then when they come to auction, um, that might be a year later and there might've been tremendous dynamics changing with the interest in the artist. And so we won't necessarily know where the demand is. And so we'll go with the, uh, the, the gallery level prices or something in line there. And we'll watch the, these works fly, you know, with extra, z with several extra zeros on top of where they were. I think that's always really eye popping to, to say. Um, I remember, uh, what was it last year? We sold a work by Matthew Wong and we had something like 18, 20 bidders that just kept going and going and going. And it was really, really exciting to be a part of. Um, to, to see that kind of change. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, in terms of the long-term, because I think a lot of what I look at is, um, is the long-term growth of paintings. I think it's just staggering to see where, where art used to be, that there were works that were sold for you know, $50,000 in the 1960s that are now millions and millions. Um, so 
you, what's, what's almost surprising at times is you'll see that kind of total growth, but the fact that it's on an annual, when you look at that on an annual basis, it may only be 15%, um, which I guess 15% for a 50 year investment is a great return. Um, but I think what's almost surprising is it almost doesn't drop off the page at times. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, super interesting and hadn't considered sort of the different ways to look at that. Um, and just back to Brooke for a minute, um, we have learned that you worked in development for a while. Um, we're curious what your thoughts on institutions need to balance making money with sort of these um, societal questions of values and ethics are. Yeah, I think this is another kind of topical issue and one that is becoming increasingly important. Um, especially coming out of this critical moment in our history, kind of globally, uh, more and more, I think audiences are thinking about where culture fits, you know, in their overall budget of time and where they give their resources. And I think for this reason, institutions need to be critically clear about their values, um, you know, beyond what their mission is as a museum, but truly what their values are as an institution, um, their commitment to their staff and to their way of operating. Because I think, you know, as people make decisions and prioritize, um, you know, differently, as we've all been affected by the events of the last year and a half, um, the relationship to the institutions that feel the most sort of um, affinity to our, the way we, you know, guide our own lives are the relationships that will stay. And, you know, for institutions to maintain their audience and their support, they've got to be really clear about, you know, what their values are. It's not just about the quality of a collection or the critical nature of exhibitions, but truly, um, you know, what the institutional priorities are, because I think we're all going to come out of this moment um, really thinking hard about, yeah, where we spend our time, where we spend our dollars, and um, the institutions that feel most values aligned with how we live our lives um, are the ones that will remain important to us. And uh, not every institution thinks about that. I mean, I think many will think that's just way too political, but it's really essential. I think institutions have to stand for something. Otherwise, they will just not get the kind of attention they need um, going forward from whether it's an, a one-off visitor or an annual member or a future donor. Um, it's, uh, I think, you know, it's just, it's just the nature of our time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and something that I definitely think about a lot um, and I'm sure all the audience members as well. Um, next question is for Michael. You've had the opportunity to publish quite a few articles on the art world since your graduation from Dartmouth. Do you have any advice for students interested in publishing someday? Yeah, so what I would say is, look, I think if you're at Dartmouth, you've got to be really smart and have a lot of really great ideas. And so what I think is really important is finding a format to really package those great ideas and share them with other people. Um, it's been really um, amazing to be able to work at an idea and then put it all together and then just let that go out and see what different people think. Um, so I would say sort of as I, I alluded to before, I think one, it's very important to work on writing skills. I think no matter what you do, where you go, being able to clearly communicate and share your ideas is, is immensely uh, important and helpful. Um, but I think also just thinking about how, you know, the fact that we're constantly learning, it is, it's also important to want to share the best with, with everyone else. Great, thank you for that. Um, and then back to Brooke for a moment. Um, we were curious about sort of what are the most effective forms of community engagement that you have seen in your career? Well, I've seen a lot, I think, across my career, but the ones that have been so intriguing um, have really been over the last year and a half. So, you know, as I said before, none of us saw this, you know, crisis coming. And what I was really excited to see over the last year and a half was how, um, quickly museums pivoted and responded to the crisis. You know, March 13th of last year, our institutions all closed with no real sense of when we would reopen, when we would welcome visitors again. And um, it was really wonderful to see how museums, you know, all over the country, all over the world embraced 
digital technology and how um, quickly they embraced digital technology and were able to scale their use of technology to not only have um, you know, public programs online and to maintain their relationship with viewers and their audiences online, but also to um, use digital platforms for the purpose of virtual fundraising um, and all kinds of community building um, initiatives. And I think certainly in the earlier part of the pandemic, when we were all locked down for many months at home, for a lot of people, it was a kind of critical way to stay engaged and to stay in discussion with like-minded people, you know, to have these moments of joy in what was otherwise a really kind of tough year um, to, you know, do a virtual studio visit with an artist uh, that, you know, maybe you were sitting in New York, but the artist is in Berlin and you could have an art experience and to be transformed, you know, for just a little while from, you know, where you were and what you were thinking about to just have this really wonderful creative experience in the company of others, you know, through a virtual platform. I think, you know, it's just, it was really wonderful to see museums um, work in such an agile way with everybody working from home um, and to create such interesting and engaging content. Um, I'm really curious to see, you know, as we emerge from this and as we um, have the chance to go back into our institutions more and more um, over the months to come, you know, how much of that will remain because I think, you know, to some extent, we all realize that having, you know, broader global audiences is essential to the well-being of any institution and really adds to the kind of conversations an institution can have. But, you know, how much of that will we maintain? You know, how will those um, digital and virtual convenings differ um, in the years to come? You know, how do we balance it between the sort of live and in-person and, and the sort of mediated by the computer? Um, yeah, it's been really, it's been really wonderful to just watch all of the creative interpretations um, over the last year. Yeah, certainly. Um, even in my internship at the museum right now, it's something that I'm constantly curious about as the campus engagement intern. Um, so thank you for that. Um, one question from the audience that I would like to get to, um, it's a bit long, so I've heard from several people in the museum arena that they have a love-hate relationship with artwork on loan. I've heard from one museum director who regularly refuses loaned artwork. Museums are expected to present, curate, administer artwork, but don't get the benefit of ownership of the piece. What are your opinions? Um, I'm not sure if either of you has and like wants to start off with that, but um, definitely an interesting question. So I don't know that I have a strong opinion about it, but because um, it's also been a long time since I have done curatorial work and have been, been you know, in the business of um, researching collection acquisitions or organizing shows. But once upon a time, I did do that. And I certainly have a number of dear friends and colleagues who are curators and in institutions. And if I could speak on their behalf, um, I would say loans are critical. You know, when you are thinking, um, you know, deep on a particular subject and have a vision for how you'd like to see a particular um, series of ideas unfold, you know, across exhibition galleries or, you know, an institution more broadly. Uh, loans are really critical to the development of an idea. I don't know that even the best museums in the world have examples of every artwork necessary to fulfill the, you know, ideas and dreams and possibilities of its curators. And so, um, you know, when possible, when budgets allow, when all kinds of logistics allow, I think it's really important to have works on loan um, so that you can, as a curator, most um, superbly sort of fulfill your vision for a particular exhibition so that a thesis is strong, so that, um, you know, exhibition galleries are visually as powerful and as impactful as they can be. Um, I only see it as a positive thing, but, you know, loans also can be quite costly and labor intensive. So, um, I imagine as the head of an institution, one has to balance, um, you know, the cost and others. Uh, but, but certainly from a curatorial perspective, I, I would imagine that um, most curators would say they're essential. You know, it's, it's very difficult to work within uh, the confines of any collection and be able to sort of creatively do everything you'd want to do, I imagine. So um, it's not a criticism I've heard before, I must say. Um, but certainly if it is something that, you know, floats around, that's, that's what I think about it. They seem essential to sort of fully realizing um, the critical thesis in most cases. 
um, I guess if I can just maybe give a little bit of, of my perspective, um, which is difficult because I've never worked in a museum before. So I don't have firsthand knowledge of all of the negatives and the costs that are associated with the, the sharing and, and, the, and the loanings. Um, although I, I've certainly heard plenty of stories, I have not seen you know, the, the real details. But what I can say is that as somebody who consumes art, who's lived in New York for a number of years and been able to go to a number of major institutions to see retrospectives um, and, and, and really important uh, ex exhibitions, I think that when, when done well, that they, at least from, when, when, when they're done well, we learn as a, as a community, we learn so much more about the artists. Um, catalog resumes exist where you can have a book that has every single picture of every known work by an artist. Um, but there's something that's really, really powerful about bringing everything together to look at it where, where new insights can be understood or, we in, or conversely, we, you can bring different artists together to see the parallels of how they, they speak together. I remember at my time at Dartmouth, one of the most fascinating exhibitions that I saw was when there were a number of works brought in by uh, Jackson Pollock and Jose Clemente Orozco. And it was all about how uh, Pollock, before he moved to his abstract expressionist strip paintings, um, he was deeply influenced by coming to Dartmouth and seeing the, the Orozco murals. Um, and so being able to just see that, I think to read an article about it certainly would have gotten the point across, but I think to see everything together was so powerful um, and so fascinating um, that I think there is so much benefit to, to, to doing it. And so, uh, yeah, I guess that's my two cents. <laughs> No, I love your comment about um, sort of this conversation between artworks, and I think the ability for loans definitely opens up um, those possibilities. So great. Before um, I pose the final question for the evening, I just wanted to remind you all to please fill out the survey for the event that um, we have just sent in the chat. So for the final question um, for both of you, how do you guys see the art world changing going forward? And how do you think the next generation of artists and art professionals fit into that changing landscape? Um, and we'll start with Brooke. Um, yeah, I definitely see, you know, certainly the museum world and the art world, you know, more broadly, you know, including the art market and, and academia becoming more inclusive. Um, and I think, you know, it's obviously on the forefront of everyone's mind, but I do think that um, institutions are taking critical steps to ensure that this happens. Um, and I think, you know, it will only allow for greater opportunity, not only for artists, but for art professionals and, you know, you know young and emerging professionals in the field. Um, I think that, you know, we can no longer sort of pretend that these issues, you know, don't exist. Um, you know, the awareness is there and it's incumbent on all of us to find a sort of path forward. Um, so I think that certainly, yeah, a lot has opened up and the possibilities um, are really quite endless when, you know, more and more people feel that um, arts and culture are, are open to them and that there's some kind of entry point or access to this, um, not only as yeah, viewers and audience, but also as professionals who can lead the field and help to define the programs of top institutions. So I would say three of the biggest trends going forward with the art market that I think are gonna be important for, for all the students listening um, are technology, diversity, and accessibility. Um, so on the technology side, I think that the strides that have been made just in general in technology have been off the charts, that there is more possible today than ever before. The fact that there is so much data being generated, there is so much more that we can do with, the, with that data. Um, there are so many possibilities of how that links in. And so there, there's, there's a, so many interesting companies I know about that are trying to leverage technology that wasn't around several years ago to be able to do new things in the art market. Um, obviously, NFTs right now are one of the biggest topics. That wasn't something that was on many people's radar a couple of years ago and has certainly exploded in the last few months. Um, so I think that uh, the different possibilities from technology. Uh, second is diversity. So obviously, um, 
I, I agree with, with everything that Brooke said. Um, and I'll also add that I think that there, ne that there needs to be more kinds of perspectives and uh, backgrounds brought into the art market. That if everybody has an art history degree, then I think there's a lot of homogeneity in thought. And so having different people with different backgrounds and different skill sets is really, really important. I think being more socioeconomically diverse is really important as well. Um, and I think that also stands, and, I, and that's also with the, the artists that are being collected, that obviously at the top, there's a lot of people who have been famous for a very, very long time. And obviously history is sort of written by the winners. But I think understanding how there is, there is great art across the spectrum and across the board from so many different geographic locations and made by all different kinds of artists that have amazing stories where those stories manifest themselves into something really special on the canvas. Um, I think it's the people, it's, it's, it's the art, it's the people that are there and having just so many different ideas brought into the ecosystem is going to be a big trend going forward from many different directions. And then the third is on the accessibility, or I'll also say uh, transparency, that I think obviously having um, Instagram, having ways to share things digitally just allows for so much more content to be distributed. Um, there, there are so many new artists that are able to be making art and to sharing that art and have a platform. And so I think about from that perspective, a lot's going to need to be done on how we, how we curate, how we bring uh, a more expanded tent together. Um, obviously, working at Sotheby's, you know, we'll, we, we sell some very expensive works going for nine figures. <laughs> um, but the truth is most art is not nearly that expensive. And it's much, some art works are way more affordable than you think that you can walk into an art gallery and for a thousand dollars, you can buy something that you really love and you find really meaningful. Um, so I think it's the combination of being able to explore more and um, in addition to bringing a more diverse background of people participating, I think is going to be really important. And I also think on the transparency side of that, um, because of many of the platforms that are being created, we have more knowledge of uh, what's out there, what things are worth. And so, um, and I think that helps the art market operate more efficiently, just having more tra uh, transparency of, of data, of pricing. Um, it was a nice thing to see during the pandemic that many galleries who would never list prices in the past were listing their prices. And so that invites more people to want to have a conversation. Um, because if you're somebody who's looking to spend $2,000 on a work of art, and you find something that you're really interested in, you find that it's worth $200,000. It's a very different conversation that can be very uncomfortable. And it's very difficult to somebody who's starting out collecting to want to enter into that. Um, but to understand that, you know, that there are different price points and to find a place that's really comfortable for you, I think is going to bring more people in to collect art uh, who aren't currently. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Brooke and Michael, for taking the time to so thoughtfully answer our questions and provide such valuable guidance to everyone who's interested in the arts. Um, and thank you to the audience um, for asking such engaging questions. As a reminder, there will be a recording of this webinar posted on the Hood's YouTube channel. And in case you didn't get the survey in the chat, we will also be emailing it out tomorrow. We would really appreciate your feedback on this experience just to help inform future programming. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks so much for, uh, for having us.